hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone. And there was a round about the throne unto an emerald. Let's stop there. So we have here uh, leaving uh, from where we were, chapters uh, 2 and 3. Chapter 1 was kind of an introduction, right? Chapter 2 and 3 dealt with the seven churches, correct? So we pick it up. Chapter 4 deals with what we see immediately. He's translated from where he was uh, on the Isle of Patmos to being in what? Heaven, in the spirit, and seeing going into heaven. All right? So we find here there is a parallel between chapters 1 and chapters 4. Because in chapter 1, we see that there is an introduction and there's a description of God. And then in chapter 4, there's an introduction and a description of God. So we find between chapters 1 and chapter 4, there's, there's, there's a distinct uh, showing of there being a different vision. So the first vision we see, he, he, he's in the spirit in chapter 1, and the spirit shows him these seven churches seven leaders of the seven churches, right? So in chapter 4, he goes in the spirit again, and then there's another vision. This vision is showing God, showing heaven, all right? So I want us to see that parallel, all right? So we read Revelation 4 and 1. We talked about the first voice was the trumpet. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. All right? There? Let's read and I was what? On the Lord's day. He was in the wet. What? I was on the Lord's day and heard what? A great voice as of a trumpet. You see the signing factor when he, when he gets, uh, sees these particular visions. He's making it clear that I was in the spirit. I wasn't in my flesh. This was not a hallucination. This was a, a spiritual vision that God gave him. And he heard a voice as if it were a trumpet. When we said trumpet, Whenever we see that in scripture, it is a warning, right? It is a warning of things to come. It is, it is also not only a warning, uh, but it is a wake-up call. If Israel heard the trumpet, it would, they would have different troubles with different things. One would be a sound to go forth in praise, it would be victory. One would be warning that it's time to fight, going into warfare. So it would, it would always be something to wake them up. So John is letting us know now when I'm in the spirit, I'm seeing this vision. Now I hear this voice as if it were a trumpet. Listen up. Listen. Pay attention to what, I, what I'm about to tell you. So when we see that, John is telling us that. All right? That's, uh, so we see just like verses four, uh, chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, we see three things. We see, we see the voice of the trumpet. We see he was in the spirit. And we see a description of Jesus. Let's... Uh, Stay at chapter 1, drop down to verse 12 through 17. Let's read that. And I turned to see the voice that spoke unto me, and being turned, I saw the seven golden candlesticks. These seven golden candlesticks say what? Seven churches, right? And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, what, what? One like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment, foot, and girt with the paps of a golden girdle, and his head were what? White like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were, and his feet were like, uh-huh, and his voice sound of many waters, and he had a what? In his right hand, seven what? And out of his mouth went what? And we said that to his sword is what? The word of God out of his mouth. And his countenance what? Was as the sun shineth in his strength. All right? We see it there in chapter 1, the description of God. Every time he sees a spirit, uh, sees a vision, uh, he sees in that, that vision 
a representation or a revelation of who Jesus is and his majesty and his glory. He begins to speak upon how uh, he looked. All right, let's, let's jump over back to chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Do we see a description there? All right, let's read it. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold... All right, stop there. Does, what number does it give us to the one that sat on the throne? What number? One. It didn't say three. Right? It didn't say and three sat upon the throne, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And one sat upon the throne. It's showing us their picture, showing us the unity of, of, of Jesus. Now, it's already given us a description in chapter one who it was. It's showing us John is telling us this, this Jehovah, this, this Yahweh of the New Testament, I see a vision. He's this one. This is how he, he, how he looks. This is how his glory shine. He's picking up in chapter 4. I'm in another vision. I'm in the spirit. And I see him sitting on the throne. There is one that sits on the throne. He's beginning to reveal to them the same one, the same uh, Yahweh, Jehovah in the Old Testament. Is this one that is being revealed to me in the New Testament? It's one that's set on the throne, consistent with what we've been taught all of our life. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. He's beginning to reveal to them. All right, next verse. And there was... All right, but rainbows uh, mean... Uh, uh, gay rights, right? Right? What, 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 what does the rainbow represent? Come on, Bible students. God's promise to who? To, to the earth through who? Noah. Remember? Noah had rained 40 days and 40 nights upon the earth, and there was a great, what theologians call deluge. Deluge means a flood, great flood. Even so much so that the water went to the tops of the mountains, covered the mountains, the entire earth. Think of all of the topography and the geography of the earth, uh, hills, mountains, so on and so forth. The flood covered all the mountains, the highest mountain in the world. The flood covered it completely. The world, uh, the, the world was literally drowned or baptized in water, right? It rained for 40 days, 40 nights, but that's not the miracle. The miracle is... That if you really study your Bible in Genesis, it will tell you that Noah and his family lived in the ark for well over a year. It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but it took about a year or and a half for the water to subside before they can walk out on dry land. All right? So that's really a miracle in and of itself. But he's showing here around the throne is this rainbow. This rainbow was the promise that he gave unto Noah that the next time that I destroy the earth, I'll never destroy it with water again, but it will be fire next time. We have many uh, storms and winds and rains and tsunamis and, and floods and all of those things, and it destroys parts of the earth, but never will it destroy the entire earth. And that's what the promise was, that the rain, I will never destroy the entire earth with water. Uh, but the next time it will be fire. So around this throne, this throne is a reminder that he who sat upon the throne has a promise to fulfill. That there are things that will come hereafter that has to be performed. This is a reminder. This 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 uh, promise is around the throne. And that's what this, this uh, rainbow represents here. All right? Now, notice what he tells them. He tells them a specific thing. I, I'm seeing things in the spirit, and the voice is telling me to come up hither. Come up where? I'm from the Isle of Patmos. I'm on earth now. But the vision is saying, come up hither. Come up to heaven. Visit, visit now. Take, I'm taking you and showing you place in heaven. I will what show you things which must come hereafter. Verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 1, rather. I will show you things that must come what? Hereafter, what, what tense is that? Is that past? Is that present? Or is that what? Future. Hereafter. 
So I'm not showing you things that I'm showing you, John. I'm not showing you things that have already transpired. I'm not showing you things that are going on right now, but I'm showing you things that will come hereafter. Remember when we said understanding prophecy, we have to understand the context of the prophecy because some of the stuff that he showed John, he said, I will show you things that now is, which was, and which what is to come. In this particular set of prophecies, he's not showing them things that which was or which are, but he's showing them things that are is to come. So remember we talked last week about us being what we call pre-trib uh, in our theology. Pre-tribulation as opposed to post-tribulation. Remember we talked about that? And the differences between that is we believe pre-trib. We, we, we believe that the saints will be raptured prior to the tribulation period. That the saints will not see the tribulation period. We don't embrace the theology of post-trib or mid-trib. Uh, mid-trib means that we will suffer some of the tribulation period. How many years of the tribulation period? We said last week. Seven years. So mid-tribulation theology believes that we will experience three and a half years of tribulation and get raptured up somewhere in the middle of the tribulation. Post-tribulation believes that we'll go through the entire seven years and then be raptured up. We believe in pre-trib. We believe that we will not see that tribulation period that God will rapture up his church uh, prior to that all right so when we talk about these things hereafter we're talking about the things that will happen uh, after he said and immediately I was in the spirit behold I was about the throne the voice that talked to me was as a trumpet we talked about the intensity of this voice could you imagine talking to uh, being in the presence of God he, 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 the only descriptive word that John could give it was it was as booming as a trumpet you put a trumpet right before your ears and let somebody blast it and see how violent that will be to your ears. This is how John was saying that that blast of who was talking to him was as if it were a trumpet uh, talking to him. He said, come up hither. We talked about that. Uh, throne was set in heaven. This shows us the place where John was taken, uh, set upon this throne, uh, the one that sat down upon the throne. Now, in, in, in those days or in ancient times, uh, as Isaiah told us, you know, I, I saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up. And I told you, uh, in, oftentimes in kingdoms, they would have a king and then they would have rulers of certain provinces and areas. They would have thrones, but their thrones would not be as high as the king, kings, all right? So we'll, we'll hear about a little bit uh, shortly these four and twenty elders that sat around the throne, that had position around the throne. Uh, but they, they were not positioned as high as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? So he that sat upon the throne uh, was as, read it. All right. All right. All right, you can stop right there. Was as Jasper and Sardin Stone. This Jasper is purple. This sardine stone is represented more so a reddish color. color, color. Whenever we see purple in, uh, in, in symbolic nature in the Bible, it typically uh, refers to royalty. All right. So when we see red in the Bible, typically it's symbolic of His blood. All right. So when He's seeing this, he sat upon the throne, he sat upon it as jasper and sardine, showing that He was not only king was also one to able to atone for sins as well. All right? So as Jasper and Sardis stone, uh, where we, and he that sat upon the Jasper Sardis stone, and there was a rainbow around about it. We talked about that. In the sight of, uh, in sight like unto an emerald. All right? Read the next one. Stop right there. Four and twenty elders. When you know, it, sometimes when the Bible in ancient times when it's representing numbers, uh, you know, you hear that number and it seems like it's easy to say twenty-four. That's all it is. Four plus twenty. Four and twenty elders. Twenty-four elders. Uh, when we look at these twenty-four elders, 
uh, that had their seats uh, around the throne. Uh, these elders uh, represent two sets of numbers. It's 12 plus 12 is what? 24. So these 4 and 20 elders are believed to represent 12 of the original patriarchs of the Old Testament, the patriarchs of the Jews, 12 of the original fathers, patriarch. Uh, you, know, you see patriarch that pertains to fathers. Matriarch means mothers. So when you see uh, patriarchs, these are some of the 12 patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. These are some of the patriarchs. Uh, uh, Joseph, some of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. So it represents 12 of Israel's patriarchs. And how many apostles were there? 12. Represents 12 apostles. Uh, so 12 plus 12 is 24. 4 and 20 elders. This is the representation of that number. Uh, whether it's figurative or literal, uh, this is what that representation means those four and twenty elders all right uh, they are elders an elder is one that is a leader amongst God's people right let's go to first Timothy 5 and 17 it gives us some, some information about an elder first Timothy excuse me 517 that the elders that rule well be counted what worthy of especially they who in the and doctrine let the elders be counted worthy of double honor they're sitting around the throne wouldn't you consider that to be double honor not only are they sitting around the throne but they're in white and they have what crowns they have gold crowns on their head there is none other than the crown of life or righteousness that the lord gives unto those that endure temptation and have fought the good fight of faith james chapter 1 and 12 I'm going to go rather quickly. You might want to just write it down and we'll, we'll read it if you can see the board. Blessed is the man that endureth temptations, for when he is, he shall receive crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Is this not consistent with Scripture, these four and twenty elders, with these golden crowns of life? They endured temptation. The patriarchs endured it. Uh, Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, we call that the Faith Hall of Fame. If you look at it and say, by faith, such and such, by faith, such and such, by faith, Enoch did not see death because he pleased uh, God, right? By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, uh, Noah did this. By faith, Rahab. We even have the heart there that, that God called that's what the scripture said, right? By faith, Rahab the harlot. She lied, literally, but the Bible called it what? Faith. Right? Isn't that what Rahab did? Rahab lied. She hid the men of God from danger. And when the people came and say, are they here? She said, no, they're not here. She hid them. She lied. But the Bible called it what? Faith. And he, it, it imputed unto her what? righteousness and considered her to be one of the great people of faith why because those were two they were intricate people in seeing the people of God enter into the promise Rahab hid Joshua Caleb and the spies that were spying the land to go into Caleb if she had offered them up then perhaps the people of God would not have received Canaan but she hid them believing and discerning that they were men of God that they were from God and hid in the Bible called it faith. Because of this, we have 12 uh, that represent the patriarchs of uh, Israel, and we have the 12 that endure temptation. Temptation, this word, uh, deals with trial or testing. Whenever we see testing uh, or trials or temptation, that means testing. It doesn't mean that I fell into sin, right? Sometimes when we see the word temptation, we think of people falling into sin. That word temptation in its original means to be tested, to have endured the test. So they endured temptation because we said that out of the 12 apostles, almost all of them uh, died not of natural causes, but were what? Martyr. All right. So we see here that if you endure temptation, when you're tried, you receive what? A crown of life. We see these four and 20 elders that are sitting there with the crown. They received the crown of life. Did they not? All right, so this is consistent with the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8.
read that for me. Not unto me only, but all right, who is this writing this particular letter here? Paul, one of the apostles, represented there. He said, Henceforth there is laid up, there is secured, there is put on reserve for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, that one who sits upon the throne, shall give me at that day. Not but he, he warns us, say, not to me only, but to all of them that love his appearing. All of those that are waiting for his appearing. All of those that are saved and ready for his appearing will get a crown. So don't get upset when you see these four and twenty elders sitting around the throne in white raiment with their own crown. There's a crown laid up for you too, Paul said. If you just be ready, if you be in the place to receive it, uh, these four and uh, twenty elders are just elders there that, that are... Uh, in the place to receive what God has for them, right? All right, back to Revelation chapter 4. Those round about the throne were four and twenty seats. On the seats were four and twenty elders, sitting, clothed in white raiment, white representative of purity, right? Whenever we see white, representative of purity. On their heads, what? Crowns of gold, gold represent, representative, whenever you see gold, is purity also, but it uh, refers to enduring testing. Because remember, when you make gold, it has to be tried in the fire, right? When it's tried in the fire, it comes forth as pure gold. Everything that is not pure gold, what? Falls off. We call it dross or waste, right? Whenever you put gold in the fire, what's pure remains, what's impure falls off and it's called waste right right so these pure gold it's around our head the top of our head our mind that we've endured the temptation we've won the battle of our mind the crown has been placed on our head pure gold symbolic of overcoming the temptation or the testing all right let's go on and out of the throne proceeded what keep reading uh-huh Stop right there. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 14. And we say when we study scripture, we study scripture in the light of all scripture. So it's profitable when we read in Revelation to read Ezekiel's account of the throne as well. Ezekiel 1, 14. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of what? flash of lightning. So when he's talking about this lightning, he's talking about these celestial beings, these angels that's running back and forth. All right? Uh, Ezekiel 10 and 5. All right? And the sound of what? Wings are heard to the outer court as the voice of the almighty what? When he speaks, stop there. So when we say thunder and lightnings, thunder is seen. Well, thunder is heard. Lightning is seen, right? Have to think about that for a minute. So when we see this, we see in both Ezekiel 1 and 14 and Ezekiel 10 and 5, one representation of those angelic hosts were as lightning to be seen. So he was letting them, when he says, in Revelation 4 here, thunder, lightning, and the, I hear it. He's showing that not only can I see them going back and forth as in lightning, I can hear their wings as in thunder. All right, you got that? I'm trying the scripture based upon the representation of what John saw and cross-representing to what Ezekiel's vision was. All right? So when we see thunder and lightning proceeding out of that, it's talking here about these angels, this angelic host, all right? It said, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning, which are what? 
before the what? Which are the? All right. This shows us here that the throne is not only a place of majesty, but it is a holy place of sacrifice as well. All right. When we talked about the jasper and the sardine stone, right? So it's not only majestic, jasper and sardine. When we said one is purple, one is orange, purple royalty, red is what? The blood. We only see blood in scriptures typically when it's associated with what? Sacrifice. All right. We're talking about the holiness. You know, when we get to the holies of holies, upon the mercy seat, there is a sacrifice. All throughout every stage of the tabernacle, we see some representation of sacrifice, right? Whether it, it's at the, uh, the brazen altar, where it's very bloody and gory. They, they prepare and slaughter right there at the, at the, in the court. Then they go to the laver and they wash, right? Right? Then they continue to offer up sacrifices. They have the table of showbread, altar of incense, candlesticks, right? candlesticks and an incense offering up an offering up to God as a sweet smelling savor, right? The candlesticks are to never go dim. They're burning day and night, right? Altar of incense. Incense going up to God as if it were the prayers of the saints. Candlesticks are burning as if it were, as us being the lights of the world, right? All right, so we go on. That's what we're seeing. So we're seeing that it's not only uh, a place of majesty. It's a throne. Yes, they, it's a throne. There's a king that sits there. But it is a holy place also. Well, we see a type of furniture uh, in the holy place on the south side of the, uh, of, of the sanctuary uh, there for the, the lamps. So let's go to Exodus 40 and 24. And it says, and he put the what? Candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. All right. So that's that's where we see these candlesticks in Revelation. You see the throne is northward. All right. Lucifer wished to exalt himself above God, which was uh, in the sides of the north. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14 and 13. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will, and I will exalt my abundant, and I will sit upon the, in the sides of the north. Consistent with Revelation showing us the throne of God would have been the north, those candlesticks would the south, where representation of the tabernacle where they were placed. Lucifer said what? He would ascend. I will ascend and make my throne, what, above the stars of God. All right? I will sit in clouds on the stars of God. Thank you. And I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation among the saints, among those showing this vision, and, and the sides of the north. This was Lucifer's problem. This is how he got cast out of, of heaven. And the writer said, when he decided to do this, he said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning, lightning, lightning. You know what we just said about those celestial beings? As lightning. He was, was he not a celestial being? Was he not an angel? Was he not part of the angelic host? So I beheld Satan falling just as those that ascend up. But I saw him descending the same way as lightning. Alright? Because we know not only him, but a third of the angelic host was cast down with him. Alright? Alright, moving on. Where are, we, where are we? Verse 6. All right. Seven spirits and be, before the throne there was a... Keep going.
right. Stop right there. You see a sea of glass. The sea of glass is, is transparent. We know the glass is transparent, so it's talking about the sea of glass. It's talking about this, this floor, this transparent sea of glass. Uh, it's, it's like crystal is what, it, what we would represent it to be. Uh, let's go to Ezekiel 1 and 26. Well, let, before we go there, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to Reve Revelation 15, 2. So the sea of glass is very important to us. It says, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, what? Mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over what? The number of his name. What's the number of his name? Alright. Stand on having the harps of God. These are those that have overcome. These are those that overcome. So showing us the sea of glasses near the throne. It's showing that we have the 420 elders. We have these beasts celestial beast going up and down as if lightning and thunder, but we also see that here, uh, that those that overcome it will be standing around in that sea of glass also. Right? So we'll have opportunity to worship him and be around the throne as well. Correct? Revelation 7 and 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a uh, what? Which what? of who all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stand what but throat before the throne and before the who's the lamb jesus clothed with what and what palms in their hands all right we are the ones that overcome we the last time the bible really makes mention of palms is right before the death of the lamb right palm sunday and what were they saying the Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. Now we get to the point we've been saved. All right? So now the palms that we wave is different. We're worshiping him. We're using that same representation that no longer do we need to cry Hosanna. We've made it. We're at the throne. God has saved us now. Right? All right. Ezekiel 1 and 26. All right, can we read that? And above the what? Firmament that was. All right, remember, remember, let's stop there. Remember in Genesis when we talked about firmament, we said there's two types. There's one that's above our head and one on this level. One is ocean, one is sky, right? Both of them, you know, the, the, the sky and the ocean, they're both oceans. One, one's on the earth, one's above the earth, right? So this firmament here, this firmament, I'm talking about the one that is above our head, was the likeness of the throne as the appearance of sapphire stone, clear like that, and upon the likeness of the throne, the likeness as the appearance of a man, what? Above upon it. All right. Just showing you the, these cross-references of how it is in the throne. In the midst of the throne, the Bible uh, tells us here, or perhaps like the sheriffs in Ezekiel 1 and 22. Ezekiel 1 and 22. And stretch forth above their heads. All right. This is showing us, talking to us about these, these sheriffs that were about the throne. So when it talks about these beasts, it's talking about these different types of angelic hosts right there. All right? These living creatures that we can find. Uh, to give you some uh, background, because I don't have time to really go through all of it, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 will tell you a lot, will cross-reference a lot with the uh, Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. So put a note to cross-reference there. celestial beings, all right? All right? Now, at this point, we're seeing 
what what many would would you know could, could you imagine how John was picturing this at this time? You know, to see a lot going on. You know, the first few chapters were mild. He was talking about the church as something that he could relate to. Seven golden candlesticks, angels of those particular houses. Okay, I can relate to that. But now the spirit has taken me to a place that I don't know anything about. You know, I can relate to earthly things, but I haven't never seen these celestial things before. Could you imagine how he must felt saying that, behold, the spirit has taken me up to this place in heaven, and now there's one that sit upon the throne whose voice is as a trumpet. You said the trumpet is woe. Could you imagine putting the trumpet to your ear and someone blowing and blasting that trumpet? How distinct and how crucial that would be. It would almost be uh, you know, startling, deafening uh, to you. And, and, and to hear him shouting and speaking with these great mumblings. Now, all while he's speaking and saying this, we have these four, 24 elders, and they're casting down their crowns. You'll see that later on. They're throwing down their crowns, crying, holy, holy. Then you see these lightning beams that's going up and down so quickly. That it's like lightning. And you hear the flapping of their wings. <laughs> as it thunder. And you're seeing all of this going on at the same time. And when you look at these beings, let's read the description of them. And there was one beast. And those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne. Who liveth what? Forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And what? That liveth forever and ever. And cast their their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast all things, and for thy pleasure... They are and are created. Now remember, this, this crown was a token or symbolism that I made. It. it was the token and the reward that they were giving for enduring the temptation. But in the presence of God, they viewed him as being so holy that that became insignificant to them. That they cast their crowns off because they recognized him to be of greater majesty than they were. Remember the scripture said, we are a royal priesthood. So when we make it there, we are literally royalty. But their royalty, they recognize, were nothing to compare to his royalty. So those 24 elders didn't look at it as a status symbol. Remember we said 12 plus 12. Uh, the 24 represented 12 of the 12 patriarchs of Israel. The other 12 represented the 12 apostles. They weren't their grandstanding, sitting around the throne, dignified, with their arms folded, Yes, I'm in the best seat in the house. I'm the most holy uh, four and 20 elders. No, they recognize the, the, the atmosphere. They recognize the moment. I want to tell you, never miss the moment when you're in the presence of God. Never be so focused on yourself that you miss the moment. They didn't let that moment go by without recognizing you deserve glory, you deserve honor, you deserve all power. Why? Because you live forever and ever. Now understand, this is interesting now, because these individuals were now, had put on incorruption. They had put on immortality. So now they were immortal, they would live through eternity. But what they understand is their sense of eternity was not consistent with God's sense of eternity because their eternity only started when they got into heaven. But there was one that was eternal before they even got there. So when God says he is for forever and ever, he had no start and he has no ending. He is alpha to the omega, first, last, beginning, and the ending, the one who was, who is, and is to come. So they recognize that I'm not even worthy to stand before you. They cast their crowns. Could you imagine how John is feeling now? To see, my God, this is what I'm here for. 
this is what the other 12 were dying for. This is why I got boiled in oil and could not die. Why could not die? Why couldn't John die? What other man do you know that could be submerged in oil and set on fire and would still live and tell the story? This man still had activities of his limbs. He went on the Isle of Patmos and was still able to write what thus saith the Lord. What man do you know that could have been burned in oil that could still have the activities of his limb, still have his faculties, still be able to see, still be able to hear, still be able to write, still be able to send forth this letter. What am I saying? The devil can't kill you when God has a purpose and plan in your life. It doesn't matter what people do. It don't matter how they try to foil it. It don't matter how they try to overturn it. If God has something for you to say, he'll get the word out whether it kills them. All folk will die around you before God allow his word to die in you. So he was able to write and say, this is what it's for. This is the anticipation of what I've suffered on this earth for. When you read this chapter 4 and you see this, you see this is the expectation. This is what I'm living for. This is why I can't give up right now. This is why I can't throw in the towel to he that overcometh continual. Just because you overcame two years ago or overcame five years ago, that means nothing. The Bible says to him that overcometh, it's a continuum. God, I'm overcoming so that one day I can stand upon this sea of glass. I can look upon your throne. I can see those that go up like lightning. And I can hear the voices of those that are like thunder. I can see these four and twenty elders. I can see these four beasts. These candlesticks which represent your churches. I can see this great multitude that is round about that no man can number. That are from every nation, from every tongue, from every walk of life. I can stem back and say, these are they that endured great tribulation. These are those that were plucked out of the fire. These are those that endured great tribulation. And we can cry like the four and twenty elders. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You are worthy of honor, power, and glory. This is what he's doing. He ends this with our worthy. say worship comes from the old English term, worth-ship. It's a ship carrying something of worth. When we say you are worthy, it's meaning that I am offering worship. I'm carrying something of worth to you. I recognize that you are worthy. You deserve it. I'm not giving you any praise that you're not worthy of. That's why we have to watch even the accolades that we give man, because certain accolades that we give man, they are not worthy of those accolades. So we encourage, we acknowledge your gift, we pat you on the back, we say great things, but there are certain places that I cannot put man because man is not worthy. And I can praise, I can give praise to someone, but I should never worship them. You're not going to hear me. We give praise to people. When people do something good, good job. That's praise. But you should never worship. When you worship, that puts them into the place of deity, of Godship. When I worship a man, it puts them in a place as if they were God. And he said, I will have no other gods before me. That's when God gets angry. He doesn't get angry when we praise each other and we thank each other and we give each other encouragement. But he gets angry when we worship and we put someone on a pedestal that's higher than them. You should be scared. You shouldn't even allow people to put you on a pedestal. I get very scared when people want to pump me up too much. I, I, I'm first to tell them to God be the glory. Why? That's not just just to do it. That's not just to have just some rhetoric to say. That's literally for God to hear, for them to hear, and for myself to hear that I'm not worthy of that designation. It's one that sits upon the throne, the Bible says. One that is worthy. One that deserves glory. One that deserves honor. One that shall receive power both now and forever. Somebody clap your hands for the only worthy one. 
Don't let people put you in competition with God. You'll never win that. Don't place me in a place higher than I should be. For even at my best, the Bible says my righteousness is as filthy rags. So I'm not on God's level. The four and twenty elders that sat upon the throne, they were beneath the throne. They sat at the bottom of the throne. They were not on the same level as one that sat upon the throne. The throne is exalted. They were below it. Why? Because God is high and lifted up. Isaiah told us his train filled the temple. And the angels cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his what? Glory. Worthy, O oh Lord. <clears throat> when they put this here, this Lord here was the same equivalent in the Greek as the Hebrew Yahweh. So when they said this here, he was revealing to them, these people are calling him Lord as if he were Yahweh. Worthy is Yahweh. But you already told me in chapter 1 and in the beginning of chapter 4, John, that this, this lamb was Jesus. So you're showing me here that this Yahweh that they're calling, that's Jesus. Remember, this book is the revelation of Jesus. He's revealing to them because many of them were still waiting for the Messiah. Many of them were still waiting for the Messiah to come and not realizing that Jesus was the Messiah. So now John is revealing to him the one that I saw set up on the throne that's Jesus it was Yahweh it was his intention all along worthy is the Lord worthy is Yahweh worthy is the one that we what receive glory and honor and power for thou hast what I told you man can make but man can never say he created because when man even if man were to invent something he was inventing something out of something that was already created. Right? So even when I invent, I didn't create, I just made. Only God created. When man does stuff, we take from materials that have already been produced and we fasten them together to make. But God creates. At the word of God, things were created. He said, let there be there were three words that shape the foundation of the world. The Bible says that at his world, the foundation of the world and the worlds and the earth were what? Framed. He said, let there be and there was. Let there be light and there was light. Let there be firmament and there was firmament. Let there be animals. There was animals. Let there be animals in the sea. Those beasts that walk on four legs, walk on the earth. Those beasts that are in the sea. Those fowl that are in the air. He said that by let there be and there was. So when God creates, he allows things to come forth that were never in existence before he didn't create from scratch because even when you have scratch you have something but he created from less than nothing and created these things at his word so they bowed to him and said you are the one that created all these things this is your mastery God even these things that are around the throne you created all the things in the earth God you created everything that has ever existed you created because you you are worthy. You are the true and living God. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In other words, everything in the earth, everything around the earth, everything above the earth, everything beneath the earth, God created. Who wouldn't serve a God like this that had already masterfully created and made all of these things by his word? never left one detail out. Could you imagine that? Most of us, we do things, we leave things out. You know what I mean? If I got a whole lot on my plate, there's normally maybe one or two things that I forgot. Oh, I forgot to do that. Even if you try to write it out, there's always something that you've neglected to write out. But can you imagine that God did all of this without having a cheat sheet, without writing notes, without having a secretary to dictate to. He did all of this by himself. He said, who should I counsel? I counsel no one. I swore by my own self. I didn't have consultants. I didn't have a board of directors. I didn't have people to remind me. And I swore by my 
own self. He said, I measured the waters in the hollows of my hands. He said, I know the number of hairs that are upon your head. He said, I'm so expansive that heaven is my throne, but earth is my footstool. He said, I gave up Egypt and in Ethiopia for your ransom. I gave up people just to have you among myself. This is the type of God we serve. We don't serve no dollar store cheap imitation God. We serve an authentic God that had all of this thing in his plan. Now, if you think that God is so meticulous that he can do heaven and earth that way, and you think he would leave out details in our little finite world, our little small lives where we only need little small needs met, God met all of these needs in heaven and you think he can't pay your light bill? You think he can't give you the right career? You think he can't give you the right mate? You think he can't guide your mind and your heart when it's broken? You don't think he can give you comfort when you need comforting? You don't think God can touch your body and cause you? No, let me scratch that. He don't even have to touch my body. He can just speak and at thy word, God, I'm healed. That's why the centurions say, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. If you just speak the word, because at thy word, things have to change. Somebody ought to just lift their hands and say, God, I just need your word uh, to just change some stuff in my life. When it doesn't look right, when it don't feel right, when it don't seem right. God, work it out. God, when I'm not right. God, when my mind's messed up, when my heart is jacked up. You said when my heart is overwhelmed, you'll lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Somebody ought to get encouraged and bless the Lord to know that God has everything in his word. He's already said it. I just got to catch up to it. He's already declared it. He's already set me up. All I got to do is get in the place to receive what God has. He's already declared it. He's set me up for it. Impose on your neighbor and say, neighbor, you already been set up for it. It's a done deal. It's settled. Go to sleep tonight to know it's already been settled. It's been settled in heaven and in earth. Stop losing sleep. Stop trying to figure out how you're going to do it. Even Jesus told his disciples, he said, give no thought for tomorrow, for sufficient is the day. Meaning there is enough for tomorrow. If you just, 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 just handle today, there's already stuff for tomorrow that is already working itself out. And I'm telling you, when God works, God works abundantly. That's why he said all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord unto the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he did predestine to be conformed to change into the image of his son i've been called i've been chosen i've been predestined i've been predestined to conform unto his image that's why you seem to do right even when you don't even know you want to do right that that sometimes you say i ain't even gonna live safe no more i ain't going back to that church no more i ain't dealing with his people no more But some way, shape, or form, you end up back in the church blessing his name. Why? Because those things are working together for your good, and he's already ordained for you to be conformed into his image. Tell your neighbor, you're going to be like him whether you like it or not. That's why you seem to love folk that you don't want to love no more. That's why you can... Uh, uh, sit in the same room with people that despitefully use you and talk against you. That's why you can still be a saint in the midst of all opposition. Why? Because God is causing us to conform into his word, his word, into who he is. I'm not perfect now, but I'm going on to perfection. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now are we the sons of God. Not next week, not 20 years from now. Now are we the sons of God. It don't appear what I'm going to be. I know you don't look it. I don't look like it right now. I might not appear like much. I might not look like holiness like you think. I might not look like what you think I'm supposed to look like. I might not be in the image of what anointed people are supposed to look like. But he said, now are we the sons of God. It don't yet appear, but we shall be like him. Why? Because when I see him, I'm going to see him him as he is and you can't come in contact with God and see him and not conform when you get in the presence of God it makes you want to do right 
Those four and twenty elders, it made them, it compelled them to worship. They couldn't be in his presence without conforming into what they needed to be. What am I trying to tell you? All you got to do is get in the presence of God and God will work everything out in you. He will begin to purge you of things that were in your heart, purge you of devices and things that used to trip you up. You'll find yourself stepping over stuff that used to trip you. Oh, y'all not going to hear me. You'll find yourself deviating uh, from ways that would have ensnared you before. Why? Because you're getting closer to the presence of God. Tell your neighbor, I can't help but look like him because I'm getting closer to him. And the closer I get to him, the closer he shows me what I got to look like. The closer I get to him, the more he reveals to me how I have to be. I can't self. I can't just sit here and be like my old self because I'm too close close to him now. I can't give up now. I can't stop now. I got to keep doing this thing because I want to get before his glory. Somebody ought to let the passion begin to stir up in you. I don't know about you, but I'm so passionate now. I got to preach and teach this thing with so much fervor. Why? Because I feel myself getting closer to God. I feel myself getting closer to his glorious and imminent appearing. There's something that's stirring up in my soul that won't allow me to rest. It won't allow me to compromise. It won't allow me to just hang out with everybody. It won't allow me just to do the same stuff I did five years ago. I got to get more of him. Anybody out here desperate and thirsty and hungry for righteousness. God, I just need more of you. He's coming back for us. And just like a runner in the final phase, tell somebody, I feel like I got my second win. I can finish this thing. I can finish strong. I can finish strong now. Somebody ought to get that in your spirit. I might have been tired before. I might have been weak and uncertain if I could finish it. Oh, but I got a second win now. And oh, I'm about to finish strong. I'm about to kick in this anchor leg. And I'm bringing this home. I'm about to come home for victory. Why? Because in a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. have time to play much no more don't have time to go through the motions but he's coming back for us somebody just thank him just take a few moments and just thank him we thank him for his word tonight This is a word of encouragement. Whenever we read this book, we read it excited because there's promises in it for us. We don't shy away from it. We don't run away from it. This no longer should be a scary book to us. We should understand it and begin to see what God is trying to reveal to us that if we live right, heaven will be our home. I'll give you a couple things as I close. A couple symbols just in your notes that we went over number one, number one is white it's always representative of purity some scriptural references for that is Revelation 3 verses 4 through 5 Revelation 7 verse 14 Revelation 19 verse 14 blue symbolic of law law, Numbers chapter 15 verse 38 through 39 purple symbolic of royalty Mark 15 17 Judges 8 26 red, scarlet associated with the blood of Jesus shed or also sin and corruption. Though so your sins be as scarlet. Isaiah 1 and 18. 
Nahum 2 and 3. Revelation 17, 1 through 4. Gold, symbolic of purity. Isaiah 13, 12. week when you're looking at numbers one represents unity Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6 John 17 verses 21 through 22 two represents truth of God's word, confirmation, the truth of God's word by two, the voice of two, should everything be established and confirmed, if there be two or three gathered together in my name, touching anything that I will be agreement, the truth of God's word, four represents universal truth. Four directions, north, south, east, and west. The Bible talks about the four winds. Matthew 24, 31. Revelation 7, 1. Revelation 20, 8. And four gospels so represents the completeness of God's truth. Down to seven, six, number of man. I know I skipped five. Five is grace. Grace, six, number of man. Six day man was created. It's the number of man or imperfection or rebellion throughout the scriptures. Genesis 1 26, verse 31. Seven represents perfection. Perfection it could be complete perfection or complete. All right, the number seven note showed it's very symbolic in prophecy, uh, especially through Daniel and Revelation. It's uh, some 42 times in Daniel and Revelation, number seven is used. We have seven churches, seven spirits, seven golden candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns. Seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven thousand slain, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven golden vials, seven mountains, seven kings. So just to show you the symbolic of this completeness uh, by the number seven that's shown throughout the Daniel Revelation. All right. Ten represents restoration. Also represents the law. We have the Ten Commandments, Ten Virgins, there were Ten Lepers. Twelve represents church, God's government or authority. We had twelve disciples, we have twelve tribes of Israel. Four and twenty elders are visions of the number twelve, 144 that we'll read about are multiples of twelve. In New Jerusalem, there are 12 foundations, 12 gates to the city. It's 12,000 furlongs long. All right? So 12 is, represents the church and God's government and authority. 40 represents testing. If you see 40 a lot through scriptures, it deals with testing. Rain, 40 days, 40 nights. It's testing. Moses spent 40 years in the desert, right? He spent 40 years. We talk about the three, three stages of Moses' life, 40, 40, 40. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian with his uncle, 40 years in the wilderness with the children of Israel. 40, 40, 40. Times of testing. Right? And 
Jesus fasted how many days? And was tempted in all points, yet not sin. He was tested in all points. Forty, showing time of testing, right? Fifty represents power and celebration. Leviticus 25 and 10. Jubilee came after the 49th year, the 50th year. It was the year of Jubilee. You were able to get a lot of your, all your stuff back. And if you owed any debt, you didn't owe it anymore. Wouldn't it be great if we had Jubilee? Because what it was, after, it was literally after on every eighth year, after every seventh year, eighth year, it was called a sabbatical. A sabbatical year, you owe everybody. That's kind of what the concept where it used to be, but not so much now that if you owe anything on your credit report, and it was old in seven years, it would fall off. That concept came from the Jewish custom of sabbatical uh, as one of the work in real estate and credit. That's not always a rule of thumb. Let me give you the honest truth about credit. That, you know, in most cases, most companies would happen in those times. Uh, most companies would not archive their records uh, past seven years. Everything was as electronic as it was now. So imagine all the records they had to keep paper. That's where that, that sabbatical year came from, that 50 uh, is, is celebration. 50 even re represents uh, Pentecost. Pentecost occurs 50 days after Christ's resurrection. All right? After Passover, 50 days after Passover is the Feast of Pentecost. All right? So the day of Pentecost was when the uh, That was a regular feast that they always had. There was this one particular different than all of the rest. All right, you got that? All right, 70 represents uh, judgment and uh, leadership. Judgment and leadership. Moses appointed how many elders? In Exodus 24 and 1, 70 elders, right? As he got older in his age, he appointed 70 elders to help him govern uh, the people of God. So at this time, well over two million, right? So how's this old man gonna govern two million people without a telephone, without email, without television, without these things? He ain't going to personally talk to seven people, only about two million people. He had to appoint elders and people within those tribes to disseminate that information. So he had 70 elders, uh, the Sanhedrin court. Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin court in the New Testament uh, that would judge the civil and religious infractions uh, of their day. When the Pharisees interpret the law, the Sanhedrin enforced the law. They were built of seven uh, people, 70 people. All right? Got it? Jesus told Peter to forgive 70 times 7. Give somebody 70 times 7. Work on me, Jesus, is all I can say. <laughs> Amen. We're going to prepare for this mess. Let's give God a praise for his word. <laughs> Amen. Thank everybody that's here. We're going to ask if our church announcer will prepare to come at this time. The person of Brother Rico Robinson, receive him by saying, Praise the Lord. <laughs> 